The last few minutes I've been pondering a story that Abdul Baha told that some of you will be familiar with. There was a gathering of wise people and uh, there was a newcomer that wanted to join the gathering. And the chairman of the wise ones put a glass on the table and poured it full of water right to the top, indicating to this newcomer that there was no place for him. But the newcomer spotted a small feather, picked it up, and floated it on top of the water without spilling anything. That's my challenge tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Goodness. You know, I mean, first of all, it's, it's thrilling to just be here. This is the holiest spot in the America. And we're in under here the holiest house of worship that will ever be constructed in the world. And why is that? And you know, of course, because the master laid its dedication stone and founded the temple. The guardian said also, this is the only temple that's also a shrine. Because wherever the holy ones were, the three central figures of the faith were, is potentially a shrine. And certainly this would be a major one for this continent. So let us bask in the potency of the favors and bounties that descend upon us in this edifice, really. It's been very uh, enlightening to me to come here to this gathering this weekend. I feel, you know, closely associated with you. I think there's a whole lot of us in, the next, in this gathering that have one foot already in the next world. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope to be able to call you to reflection about what should be the last of our gasping efforts, so to speak. <laughs> Many of you have served for years. I went to the Montana summer school this year, just an interruption here. <laughs> And I asked the friends, who also seem to be quite a senior group, <laughs> how many of you have been Baha'is for 20 years? Almost all the hands in the room went up, 100 of them. Then I said, how many have been 30 years? All the hands went up again. <laughs> <laughs> they have a fellowship once a year at the summer school because they're, most of them are isolated in small towns in Wyoming and Montana and so on. Probably some of them are here tonight. <laughs> there they are waving in the back. <laughs> Friends, I know the House of Justice is longing for a wave of teaching. We have the plans, we have our collective tasks set before us. We have agencies, we have appointees who are able to tell us all about that. In moving around in the country and in other countries as well, I find that it's helpful for all of us to recall that we have two kinds of responsibilities in the cause. We have individual responsibilities and we have collective responsibilities. And I tend to see, traveling around, that some of the friends are trying to derive what they should be deriving from their individual responsibilities from the collective responsibilities. And then you find people with a bit of a burnout that say, I'm not going to another cycle of growth again, and something of the sort, you know? And not to make a negative remark, but you're all familiar with this process, I'm sure, because we've been facing the challenges of initiating entryway troops in this country now for 25 years. Over and above our collective responsibilities, 
which derive from the Lesser Covenant and from the House of Justice describing the stages that are unfolding in the process of the carrying out of the divine plan, we have the immediate responsibility of what is our first duty as a Baha'i, a first duty as a person, if you will. Interestingly enough, the Akdas opens with the recognition of the manifestation of God. The first duty of anybody in this planet is to recognize the manifestation of God. Then he calls upon those of us that have recognized it to live according to his teachings. And he places a high priority on our teaching of the faith itself. But that has a two-stage process, if I think we will all recall. He says that you must uh, arise and teach the faith. But before all things, he said, you must teach yourself. You must teach yourself the content of the revelation, the meaning of the revelation. You must draw close to Baha'u'llah. And if you do so, he says, your words will take effect in the hearts of your listeners. Otherwise, he said, there will be no effect, whatever. He says, it's not a direct quote, but there's several tablets where he says exactly that. It, it calls us to a certain earnestness of reflection about ourselves and our relationship with, with the writings. And I want to lead us through a few uh, passages from, from the text uh, that uh, maybe suggest to us how can we quicken this process in ourselves? How can we arrive at, uh, um, let's say, a fresh stage of excitement about propagating the cause leading up to this bicentenary of the birth of the Bob that the House has indicated is a period when we should be accelerating everything. I mean, they've asked for, you know, Herculean efforts. Abdu'l-Bahá trumps that. Sorry to use that verb. <laughs> in, in, in the sense, in the divine plan, where he tells us that you must increase your efforts a thousandfold. Now, that sounds more like it's something that goes with the passage of a gnat can become an eagle and a drop can become an ocean. I mean, this is a thousandfold increase that's beyond our capacity unless we become um, willing elements for the transformation that he promises will take place if we arise and propagate the cause and teach the cause. Now, in our collective activity, we have organized times and things to do, but our individual responsibility comes from the divine plan from, and from the will and testament of Abdu'l-Bahá. These are the, among the final words of Abdu'l-Bahá to the friends everywhere. It is incumbent upon all the friends and loved ones, one and all, to bestir themselves and arise with heart and soul and in one accord to diffuse the sweet savors of God, to teach his cause and to promote his faith. It behooveth thee not to rest for a moment, neither to seek peace or repose. In a tablet that supplements this thought. He says, when the friends do not endeavor to spread the message, they fail to remember God befittingly and will not witness the tokens of assistance and confirmation from the Abha kingdom, nor comprehend the divine mysteries. Again, from a tablet of Abdu'l Baha, should a Baha'i refrain from being fully vigorously and wholeheartedly involved in the teaching work, he will undoubtedly be deprived of the blessings of the Abha kingdom. 
Again, he says we should be engaged constantly in the propagation of the faith, the teaching of the faith. This is a 24-hour element. We only rest and sleep to be able to arise and teach again. We have to ask ourselves, have we lost sight of that or have we never attained it? If we want to create this acceleration in the community and attract new souls, all of the processes of the five-year plans that we've been carrying out depend on new recruits, depend on human resources. How many times are we going to go ourselves over and over the courses of the Ruhi course? It's for bringing new people through the knowledge of the cause. So we have to give sufficient time at our own individual level to attracting new souls. And I think that uh, what I'm hearing in different places is people are not too prepared to talk about the faith in a like to give a introductory talk to friends. We've been encouraged to do things together and accompany each other and so on. And somehow we've lost sight of the need to be able to speak clearly and give the message of the faith in such a way that people will be attracted and interested and will go into the, the um, institute process and take part in the other activities of the cause. It's urgent. In another place, he says, should the friends not engage in the teaching, the divine confirmations will be cut off. And he said, and there will be no spiritual progress. No spiritual progress unless we teach, friends. As soon as you stop teaching, the angels are busy with something else. The concourse, you know, he promises this. The concourse is all lined up. Shoghi Effendi says that the bounties of the kingdom have not been drawn on sufficiently. He said this in the last years of his life. He says, so it's under pressure. So you don't have to do a lot of movement before you get this bolt of assistance, divine assistance. And you have to trust. If we put our trust in him, he says, then we will be able to go forward with the teaching work. Now I noticed uh, he says that uh, you know the pattern of Abdul Baha told Anis Ride out. It's an old story where one of the early friends in his time asked Abdul Baha how she could better her teaching work, how she could improve her teaching work. Interestingly enough, he said that in order to improve your teaching work, you must live the life. Live the life. Live the life. It's three times. In order to live the life, he says, you have to acquire thirst for spirituality. Thirst for spirituality, he says, comes from study of the writings on immortality, on life after death. Because that's the thing that sets us wondering what's going to happen to us after we pass away. And we're supposed to obey the teaching in order that we go to the next side feeling able to survive there, so to speak. If the teaching work is the source of divine confirmations, is the source of our receiving the bounty of the Holy Spirit, which is what develops and makes our soul grow, it nourishes our soul, so to speak. If we don't receive that, we don't grow spiritually. We may grow in activity, but that's not the same thing. God will surely bless us and reward us for all our efforts. But the divine confirmations, this power of the kingdom, which accompanies the teaching of the faith, is central. Now, yes, we want the cause to grow. But Abdu'l Baha says, without some prospect of gain, the self-interest is so seated in man that he won't make a move. So I'm trying to sharpen a point here tonight for all of us, myself included, of course, that if we don't teach, we're not going to move forward spiritually. And then when Abdu'l Baha says it's the greatest gift of God, he says that because it's essential for our spiritual well-being and our condition in the world to come. And the teacher gets a whole lot more out of it 
than the recipient of the message. Because the teacher is engaged in begging the confirmation of the kingdom. He's engaged in communion with Baha'u'llah. He's trying to radiate the light of the divinity that comes from Baha'u'llah to his soul to seekers. In a gentle way, no proselytization, but let us examine this together. Or were you aware that this is the case? And learning the proofs of the reality of God and the meaning of the divinity of the manifestation and the wisdom of all of these new principles that have been brought, which Baha'u'llah has brought and Abdu'l-Bah says are unique to this day. Just an example of the equality of men and women. It's taken for granted now. This was not the case. No religion of the past has said men and women were equal. No, some of them say half the soul. Woman has half the soul of a man. Baha'u'llah has brought this as a new principle. When you see it in the principles, this is new and different. And Abdu'l-Bah says you should study and reflect on these principles to discover their divine meaning and intention. We say, oh, I've seen the list. Sometimes we, we use the list, you know, we repeat, we believe in universal peace. And the people look at you like, what? <laughs> Where is that? <laughs> because we're so familiar with it, we repeat it glibly. We don't believe in universal peace. We don't believe universal peace exists. We believe that there has to be a program for establishing universal peace. We believe there should be certain uh, provisions that will lead to the establishment of lasting and permanent peace. When you see Shoghi Effendi list the principles in several places as he does in God Passes By, for example, he connects verbs with the uh, principles. He suggests to us the direction that this is taking. Very, it's very useful and important to us. Abdu'l-Bah is the greatest example of teacher that we have. He's the exemplar, but particularly he's the exemplar of teaching. And Shoghi Effendi in several letters has said that you cannot take a better model than Abdu'l-Bahá's talks in the West to teach the cause. How much do we study those? I, I would say, I, I, I always feel uh, saddened, you know, when somebody says, well, I teach, I try to teach, but nobody's interested. Abdu'l-Bahá says that people will be interested in what you're interested in. This is in a letter quoted from the Guardian. If we're on fire with the divine teachings, we can't help sharing it with others. This is something that is our covenant with Baha'u'llah. And that's the covenant that makes us then obey the lesser covenant of the administration, of the guidance of the Universal House of Justice. It's all tucked together. But we need to bring that kind of devotion and earnestness as individuals in our daily life, seeking for waiting souls, as the Guardian suggested we do. There are those elements in the population who are ready. I saw a letter from Shoghi Effendi. He said, if the Baha'is would leave, live the life, Baha'u'llah will guide souls to them. Wow, that's a whole lot easier than going door to door. <laughs> or is it? <laughs> because living the life is such a challenge to us, really. <laughs> the teacher, when teaching, must himself be fully enkindled so that his utterance, like unto a flame of fire, may exert influence and consume the veil of self and passion. Otherwise, his teaching will have no effect. How many times we find this add-on phrase that says, if you don't do this, nothing's going to result from it. And if you feel like you're not having the results you need, then maybe we need to look back at the requisites refresh ourselves and think, what, what is it I could add to this? These divine promises 
Shoghi Effendi, uh, uh, in the letters that the House of Justice gathered about teaching, he says that um, the first kinds of letters are that we must not heed our own lowliness, our own ineffectiveness, our own weakness. He said, you'll paralyze yourself if you look at yourself. I mean, we're all full of shortcomings. So if you're not going to look at that, what are you supposed to look at then? <laughs> and then there's a second set of letters in which he says that the friends must turn to the divine promises. He calls all of us to teach the cause, arise and teach the cause. And he promises if you arise, angels will come and assist you. They'll touch the hearts of the, of the believers. And we're, our history is full of this. So do we need to renew? We need to look at those, those promises and take hope from them. And then he said, let the, let the doubter step forward and test them. Test the promises. So he even goes that far. And the crusade, he's trying to move, move the people. And he says that. He said, let the doubter arise and see for himself. But in order to teach properly, we have to adhere to all the admonitions to study the writings carefully, to imbibe the text, to immerse ourselves in the ocean of the revelation. Then we'll have this kind of consciousness which enables us to share it with others. In the Tablets of the Divine Plan, Abdu'l-Baha addressing the American believers, and I think it's time we uh, reflect again on how we might be the forefront of a surge of teaching in the world, all over the world. There are some brighter spots here and there, but in general, the, the teaching work has not been moving forward in the sense of drawing people, as Baha'u'llah says, the first duty is to draw your neighbor to the law of God. This is the first thing that we're supposed to be doing with regard to teaching. He also says in a passage in the Gleanings, he said, You're, we're called on, all of us are called to on arise and teach the cause. He, he, in fact, he doesn't say teach there, he says proclaim. We're all invoked, the duty of every Baha'i is to proclaim the cause of God. Now, proclaim the cause of God sounds like a big word and difficult and so on. But as I understand it, because he follows this phrase, he says, proclaim the cause of God. If anyone shows interest, so you don't have their interest first, you're proclaiming the existence of the cause. If they show interest, teach them. What an interesting reversal of the way we think about it. And I saw a letter from Shoghi Effendi, he said that you should always mention the name of, of the Baha'i Baha and Baha'u'llah in conversations with people. That reminded me of something I heard from the Baha'is early on, and I don't know, I don't have a quote for it, but I think it's very wise, where Abdul Baha'i said that if you're going to see a person once, mention the faith, teach the faith. If you're going to see them multiple times, live the life. You know, you've got to move into an apartment house and you see the neighbor down the hall and you run down the hall and say, have you heard of Baha'u'llah? It's a, bit, it's a bit direct approach, you know. <laughs> You show them some kindness and some love and make friends with them and gradually they're going to ask you, what is it that makes you shine the way you shine? So, Shoghi Fendi in a letter says that the, it's, it's as if, mm, this is not what he said, but I'm saying, it's as if there's a, a niche, there's some place in the soul, in the subconscious, where this, it immediately rivets on Baha'i and Baha'u'llah. It goes, it goes in there and it stays there. He said, it goes in, and this is the only letter I've ever seen where Shoghi Fendi uses the word subconscious. He said, it goes into the subconscious of the person and it stays there and it acts over a long period of time and may gradually reform their character. And they'll have more opportunities to hear about the faith. And that's a, a process begins. It's amazing. So don't be hesitant about it. 
and maybe find ways to mention the faith when you're going to see some, somebody once. I don't know. I, my, I'll tell you one of mine is sometimes I'm on the plane and the person's had their earphones in the whole time and we're about to get off the plane and they undo their earphones and I immediately asked them, I said, you know, I'm new here to this city. Do you know any Baha'is here? <laughs> and, and they say, the Baha'is? Or they don't. They said, oh, I was raised near the temple. That happens too sometimes. But they don't, no, they haven't heard the name. I said, you haven't heard of Baha'is? Oh, that's, that's surprising. <laughs> <laughs> Something that piques their curiosity, you know. I also have a card with my name, and I'm talking about my art, so I'll give them a card, and on the back, I'll point out that this Baha'i.org is very, that's a very interesting, you should probably know something about that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Again, how do, we, how do we have that in our mind all the time? Standing in a, a line in the grocery store, all, all the possibilities we have but remembering the magic of this name, Baha'i. We know uh, that the nature of our teaching is to comply with the tablets of the divine plan. And I'll go now to that quotation that I was mentioning. O ye kind friends, uplift your magnanimity and soar high toward the apex of heaven so that your blessed hearts may become illumined more and more day by day through the rays of the sun of reality. That is His Holiness Baha'u'llah. At every moment the spirits may obtain a new life and the darkness of the world of nature may be entirely dispelled. Thus you may become incarnate light and personified spirit become entirely unaware of the sordid matters of this world and in touch with the affairs of the divine world. The aim is this, also from the Tablets of the Divine Plan. The aim is this, the intention of the teacher must be pure, his heart independent, his spirit attracted, his tongue at peace his resolution firm, his magnanimity exalted, and in the love of God, a shining torch. Should he become as such, his sanctified breath will even affect the rock. Otherwise, there will be no result whatsoever. As long as a soul is not perfected, how can he efface the defects of others? Unless he is detached from aught else save God, how can he teach severance to others? These are terrific challenges to us in our own individual relationship with Baha'u'llah and with the cause that we need to ponder and reflect on. That's the reason they're written here, the reason they're revealed for us. We're called to study the writings and then we're called to meditate on the meaning of the verses. And I've heard Shoghi Fendi say that there were, there were two, these are two distinct processes. Prayer is one thing, or study of the right is one thing, and meditation is another. But think how many times, for those of you that have hopefully recently read the Kitab Igan, or reread the Kitab Igan, how many times he says, consider, ponder, meditate, reflect, at the beginning of the sentence over and over. It's not enough just to read, although that's inspiring, and he says, do it morning and evening so that you'll give wings to your soul, so that you can lift yourself in flight during the day. But that's not the same as immersing yourself in the ocean of his writings. That's another thing. Now, what in the world could it mean to become sanctified spirit, to become incarnate light? In the recent... Uh, compilation that the House of Justice prepared for the Counselors Conference in the Holy Land at the time of the convention. There is this beautiful passage which I think illumines the idea of becoming incarnate light. This sounds you know, so, so far beyond us and yet we're called to this 
It's the focus that exists in the writings for us. When the light of faith is kindled in the lamp of the heart and soul, its spreading rays illumine every limb of the body. When this resplendent light shineth forth through the medium of the tongue, it's made manifest in the powers of speech and utterance. When it beams, its beams fall upon the eyes, insight and true vision are revealed. And when it stirreth the ear, it bestoweth attentive hearing. When this light sheddeth its radiance upon the mind, it leadeth to the recognition of the all-merciful. And when it setteth glow the limbs, it findeth expression in purity and the worship of God. Otherwise, all physical powers, all limbs and members would remain useless and futile, and their actions would fade like a mirage in the desert. I'm after something here. Let's see if I can find it. Hmm. This was in a letter written on behalf of Shoghi Effendi in 1956. If the friends only realized that only a few times in history have opportunities for immortal glory come to a people, and that that time is now in their hands. They would not for a moment, if this was the case, busy themselves with idle conversation and gossip, but would sacrifice their all for the quickening of the people and the salvation of society. We are at a very marvelous moment in history in which to perform great deeds. Think if you were born 250 years ago. <laughs> what part would you have in this? Abdu'l-Bahá says in a tablet that the recognition, having had the recognition of the manifestation of God, which you all have attain to. It would be insufficient, he says, to prostrate yourself a thousand times a day in thanksgiving to God for that. Now, how do we translate that into full-time teaching of the faith, whatever our circumstances, whatever our job, whatever our education and study, whatever occupies us in life? There was a counselor in Turkey. He, he had all kinds of teaching methods. He didn't speak English very much, but he went to Switzerland. He was in Switzerland, and he was trying to figure out how to teach, and he was, there was nobody to translate for him. He said he was staying with some friends who had a dog. He said, could I walk the dog? It's called dog walking teaching. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you talk about each other's dogs, and then you gradually start a conversation, and you mention Baha'u'llah, and, He had deer hunting teaching methods. <laughs> he had full-time airplanes, sometimes, on, I think mostly on Turkish airplanes. He would stand up in Turkish and say, I have an important message for you all. And he'd just begin belting it out to the whole <laughs> airplane. All right, Abdu'l-Bah says we need to use wisdom. I think say, he did, this guy did use wisdom. He did it in such a nice way, and it was so humorous that people didn't get offended. And they heard about it, and some would follow through on it. How do we find the special circumstances in our own lives which enable us to do this? And I think that it's, uh, one of the keys is trusting in the power of prayer. You know, if you're engaged in this, there's a, there's a quotation. I think it's in the Advent. By the way, go back to the Advent over and over. This is a marvelous source for all the things that we're talking about here tonight. 
It says that your name is better known in the Supreme Concourse. If you're engaged in propagating the faith and promoting the faith, your name is better known there than it is to your own self. I'm getting old enough to forget my name, so I suppose. <laughs> Here's an admonition, a scary one. It's also very important to hold study classes and go deep in the teachings. A great harm is done by starting to teach without being firmly grounded in the literature. Little knowledge is dangerous, fully applies to the teaching work. The friend should read the writings and be able to quote from the tablets when discussing subjects pertaining to the faith. Now, God judges us all according to our talents and our capacities. It's true. But have we made the effort to do that? Have we earnestly engaged in reading the literature of the cause? Uh, there are two or three letters I saw of Shoghi Effendi last, uh, about three years ago, in which he's addressing new believers. He says that the guardian sincerely hopes you will use your leisure time to deepen and read the words of Baha'u'llah the teachings of Bob. In one of these uh, letters, he said he hopes you will find a couple hours a day to do this. Friends, when have any of us studied the word of God a couple hours a day ever in our lives? The circumstances of this materialistic civilization just drive us in so many other directions. What would happen to us? What would happen to society? What would happen to our soul if that happens? I said, oh, thank God I'm retired. I can do that. <laughs> and I set out the next day to do it. I think it was about 10 or 11 minutes when I fell asleep. <laughs> While you're young and have the energy, engage in it because later on it becomes much more difficult. What does it mean if it says we'll be deprived of the blessings of the Abba kingdom? We will not grow spiritually. The Holy Spirit is what makes us grow spiritually. The manifestation of God appears because human beings are not good in themselves. I know that sounds very heavy in the uh, political correctness of the day we live in, but it's pretty clear. Baha'u'llah says in the gleanings, he said, all good comes from God. And all evil comes from your own selves. God doesn't produce any evil. All evil in the world is coming from us. And no good comes from us unless we turn to God. We can't produce it ourselves. And if we do, it's an ego trip. It's a kind of, I want to look good in society, so I do all kinds of wonderful philanthropic things and make you feel good about me. God forbid if we knew what they do at night in the dark, you know, this the other side of that coin. God forbid if he knew what we do alone in the dark, that's another question. We have to examine ourselves and look at this and ask for the mercy of God and his, his assistance to us. Also in this letter in 1956, he says he hopes and prays, this is on behalf of the guardian, he hopes and prays the individuals will arise fully conscious of their divine task and with enthusiasm spread far and wide the cause of God. After all, the faith rests on the individual and it is the individual who causes the faith to go forward progressively or who retards its growth. The individual who is fully dedicated, consecrated to the noble mission with which he has been entrusted, who studies the word, who meditates on its spiritual significance, who prays for divine confirmations, and who then arises and acts and perseveres in his action. That one is the pillar of the faith and the basis of a thriving Baha'i community. 
What a wonderful promise. How to bring new life into our collective activities. How to fulfill those wishes of the House of Justice as we develop these uh, core activities of local Baha'i communities, which is a terrific thing that the House initiated back in the 90s. It's this transformation in the nature of Baha'i. We had no identity of a Baha'i community. We had 19-day feast. You bring people to the cause, they hear about the cause. They said, well, do you have some activities? Uh, well, we have these meetings we have there. Yeah. Um, we have feasts, yes, but it's forbidden for you to go to them. <laughs> well, that, was, that was very helpful to, for people there. Yeah. reiterate a bit again this promise of Baha'u'llah. He said, Whoso riseth among you to teach the cause of his Lord, let him before all else teach his own self, that his speech may attract the hearts of them that hear him. Unless he teacheth his own self, the words of his mouth will not influence the heart of the seeker. Take heed, O people, lest ye be of them that give good counsel to others, but forget to follow it themselves. The words of such as these and beyond the words, the realities of all things and beyond these realities, the angels that are nigh unto God bring against them the accusation of falsehood. I briefly pause and ask your indulgence to pray for me on behalf of my words exceeding my deeds tonight. If you'll just remember that would be appreciated. <laughs> What a promise, but what an admonition at the same time. When Shoghi Effendi uh, responded to believers about what should be the main object of their study, when we hear he said, you have to study the writings for yourself, what are the writings that he m most mentioned? And of course, these, these are timed in a, in a period when he, he hadn't added more things to them, so we can add a few extra ones. But he, he said the Kitab Egon particularly, and some answered questions. And the Dawnbreakers, which he took his good time to edit for us in such a way because he said it will be the source of inspiration that will move the divine plan forward. He's, he, he connected it. Oh, For instance, here's a letter that uh, was recently published in uh, a book of some of Ali Nakchavani's talks. He, he had permission to publish this, and it's from Shoghi Effendi from the 8th of June, 1933. The Guardian, through his secretary, says, he was deeply gratified to learn that the reading of the Dawnbreakers has deepened your knowledge of the cause and has inflamed you with new courage and faith. The tale of these immortal heroes of God, so well narrated by the powerful pen of Nabil, is indeed stimulating and spiritually uplifting. It gives the reader a new vision of the cause and unfolds before his eyes the glory of this new manifestation in a manner hitherto unknown. Nabil's narrative is not merely a narrative, it is a book of meditation. It does not only teach, it actually inspires and incites to action. It quickens and stimulates our dormant energies and makes us soar on a higher plane. It is thus of an invaluable help to the historian as well as to every teacher and expounder of the faith. What a terrific letter this is, friends. Have you absorbed all you can absorb from the Dawnbreakers? Have you tripped over the first set of Persian names? And <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I know I read it the first time, you just skip the names. But then it, it can be very confusing. You don't know who's doing what, you know? <laughs> so you've got, to, you've got to put the effort in, the time in, to make yourself a list of characters and add notes to that. It requires some study. 
And Shoghi Effendi recommended it especially to the youth. They should learn episodes from it and be able to repeat these episodes in the, in the, in the gatherings of their friends. We've kind of lost track with that. I think you'd find that the youth activities, the youth animators and so on, would be greatly stimulated. And, show, and the House of Justice has called us, called to mind the heroes of the, of the Bob's period in recent messages. Where else would we learn about them if we didn't return to the Dombergers? Now there may be some people, the, I know there have been, who discourage Dombergers classes, that's not part of the plan. All right, that's the collective side. On the individual side, you've got the mandate here from the Guardian to read it yourself for yourself. Or the small friends or your family or whoever it might be. Uh, this last year, how are we doing with time here? Okay. This last year, I put together a small compilation about steps to success in Baha'i service. The Guardian was stressing these points the last two years of his ministry before he passed away. Here's a sample. You'll see what the importance of it is because it's four steps. These four steps are repeated over and over. Success will crown the efforts of the friends on the home front when they meditate on the teachings, pray fervently for divine confirmations for their work, study the teachings so that they may carry their spirit to the seeker, and then act, and above all, persevere in action. When these steps are followed and the teaching work carried out sac sacrificially and with devoted enthusiasm, the faith will spread rapidly promise of the guardian. Again, he said, the keynote of success in the teaching field is study of the word, prayer, meditation, and then action. Above all, perseverance in action. When these steps are followed, the realm of self-sacrifice, in the realm of self-sacrifice, success will be achieved. Now, one of the letters of the guardian, he outlined the main forms of sacrifice that we face in the cause, he calls us to. The first one is financial sacrifice. You're all engaged in that this weekend and thinking about that subject. The second one is more surprising, He's a, but you immediately will identify with it, and that is the sacrifice of one's time. Finding time out of our life that we want for other things, sacrificing that to give the time to the cause and to its activities and to everything we need to do for the faith. And the third one is even stronger. He said it's the sacrifice of your person, your concept of who you are, where you want to go in the world, and so on, and you're giving, you modify that. You give up some of that to give it to the cause. Now, basically, whatever we have in us is not going to be much use in the next world unless it's coming as a reward from the teaching work from the treasures and divine mysteries that we accrue to or attract to ourselves if we engage in this thing all the time. Back to how much time do we have left, friends, not tonight, but in our lives, how much time do we have left <laughs> to make a difference, to maybe accelerate in some way this process? It's, and it's really a challenge. I mean, I know from the individual lives of believers, some of the circumstances, it's very difficult to find who to talk to about. But it's not difficult for Baha'u'llah. Somehow, Mr. Sears, the hand of the cause, he used to say, well, I wanted to tell you one thing he's, he used to say a lot. <laughs> uh, and then I'll get to this one. <laughs> he would say, friends, if you don't feel as close to God as you used to, who moved? That's such a useful one for all of us. <laughs> now he said, arise in the morning and commune with Baha'u'llah and beg him to guide you to waiting souls. And then he had a little rider on the end of it. He said, 
and beg him to help you to recognize them when you meet them. Because <laughs> sometimes we don't think this is the best one for the faith. You know? No, we're looking for waiting souls, any soul. To the hands of the cause serving in the West here, the Guardian wrote in 56 also about these four stages in a slightly different way through his secretary. The beloved guardian has stressed over and over again that to effectively teach the faith, the individual must study deeply the divine word, imbibe its life-giving waters, and feast upon its glorious teachings. He should then meditate on the import of the word and finding its spiritual depths, pray for guidance and assistance. But most important after prayer is action. After one has prayed and meditated, he must arise, relying fully on the guidance and confirmation of Baha'u'llah to teach his faith. There's the formula. Perseverance in action is essential, just as wisdom and audacity are necessary for effective teaching. The individual must sacrifice all things to this great goal and then the victories will be won. Standard is so high, friends. If we're not growing at the pace that we feel we should grow, we have to put more into it. Wealth, time, and person seems to be the formula. Okay, you can't tell the others to do that. I'm sorry I've told you that tonight, but we can talk to ourselves about it, about these three dimensions, importance of them. Bill Sears uh, was uh, out also again uh, teaching in Africa and the Guardian was calling for this perseverance everywhere. And he had a cartoon made of a desert island or about the size of this stage here with one palm tree in it <coughs> with coconuts and a couple in bedraggled clothes standing in the water having picked a bottle out of the water and uh, reading a message that was inside this bottle which says, persevere, shogi. <laughs> <laughs> it eventually made its way to the Guardian and they said he had a good laugh about it too. <laughs> but the people would write him and say, Joey Vindy, I'm, I'm here, I came to the goal, but I've lost my job, so I'm having to return. Change your job. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Don't let the virgin goals fall back into virginity, he said. Okay, interesting concept. <laughs> One more confirmation in that direction, and then we'll stop. When a person becomes a Baha'i, actually what takes place is that the seed of the spirit starts to grow in the human soul. Letter from the Guardian. The human, the seed of the spirit grows in the human soul. We got two things going on. The soul, everybody's got a soul, but the spirit is potentially there. This, this gift of knowledge of divinity that's placed in every human reality has a time when it awakens. The seed, this seed must be watered by the outpourings of the Holy Spirit. In another place, he says, the Holy, Spirit, the Holy Spirit is in the manifestation of God while he's here and in his words and everything he says. Afterwards, the Holy Spirit is incarnate in the words, the verses of God. That's where we get it. So we have the obligatory prayers and we have the prayers for the fast. That's where we commune. That's where we draw the boundaries of the Spirit, so to speak. These gifts of the Spirit are received through prayer, meditation, study of the holy utterances, and service to the cause of God. If you look at the compilation on the power of divine assistance, where he tells you to ignore your shortcomings and your weaknesses, don't focus on those because they'll paralyze you. Uh, some, someone pointed out to me that God is the ever-forgiving, all-forgiving, most forgiving, I think you'd have a hard time thinking up something to do that he couldn't forgive. Don't work too hard on it, but 
<laughs> the point is, if you have something in your past and you're trying to get over it, let God be God. And don't you try to be God and say, well, if I were God, I wouldn't forgive that. So I can't teach the faith or I can't do this. We, we give ourselves excuses, you know. I'm not as pretty as I used to be, or I have no wealth to spend on teaching, or I have no time, I'm busy with my grandchildren. Well, it's fair enough. But we have to find time for all of it. He calls it to us. Let us beseech Baha'u'llah in this blessed structure to give us new energy, new vision, new life, and let us prepare it all so that we can place it at the threshold of Baha'u'llah the next time we visit. Thank you so much.